Om Magyana Timarandasya Kyananjana Shalakaya Jaksurun Militan Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Vayevacha Patitanam Pavan Hebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we're continuing our Bhakti Shastri course and we're on chapter 11. Right? Yes, Maharaj. So let's just see what we were hoping to achieve. Are you seeing the the uh, PowerPoint okay? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Oh, good. Uh, Slideshow. All right, we were to try to achieve these different aims. Does anyone remember why are devotees not concerned with seeing the Vishwarup? Do you remember that? The devotees like the loving feature of Krishna. Yes, they like the loving feature. You don't see that loving feature in the Vishwarup? It's scary because lots of hands, lots of faces. Right. Okay. That was also one. Also, we cannot serve. Also, we cannot serve the wish for Okay. There's no mood of service. Yes. No reciprocation of loving feelings. Okay. Yes. No reciprocation. The what is interested in the uh, two-handed shams in the form of Krishna? Yeah, we're more inclined towards Shamsundar, the two-armed form. Okay, let's go on. Okay. So the first section is Arjuna's request and Krishna's description of his universal form. And we're going to go on to hear about Sanjay's description of Arjuna's vision. Okay, here were the two reasons given why we're not very anxious to see. Or, oh, this is the reasons why Krishna showed the universal form. All right. First of all, to establish his divinity and also to set the criterion for other people. So, remember Prabhupada explained, rather than just, Krishna had, Krishna's already established himself philosophically, but Arjuna wanted him to do it practically in a manner in which everyone could, which could actually be seen. 
So by Krishna displaying the universal form, it, it, it was a practical exhibition. Prabhupada called the universal form a godless display of opulence. Right? So Krishna showed it to satisfy Arjuna's desire. He wanted the, the criterion should be there that other people who claim to be God, they would have to come up to that stand, they would have to achieve that. All right, so these were other, the other points. Why do we not care for the universal form? No loving feeling. And then devotees not much interested, unable to reciprocate the loving feelings, right? Devotee wants to offer his respectful feelings, he wants to see the two-handed form so that he can reciprocate in loving service. Good. You quoted both all these points. Very good. Okay. And then we heard about the imposter and how we have to, how he was telling that we have to surrender like Arjuna. And what are we supposed to say to him? We're supposed to say, kick on your head with shoes, you rascal. We're supposed to point out his shortcomings, that Krishna had a body which doesn't grow old, you know, but your body's aged. Your hair is grey and falling out. Your organs are weak, you have to wear eyeglasses to see properly. What kind of God are you? Krishna was in the world more than a hundred years. He didn't have any grey hairs. He was just still like a young man, although he was a grandfather. All right, so we go on to the next section, Sanjay's description of Arjuna's vision. All right, here's a quote from Bhagavad Gita, verses 10 and, 10 and 11. Arjuna saw, right, Arjuna, what Sanjay is describing Arjuna's vision. Arjuna saw in that universal form unlimited mouths, unlimited eyes, unlimited wonderful visions. The form was decorated with many celestial ornaments and bore many divine upraised weapons. He wore celestial garlands and garments and many divine, uh, many divine scents were smeared over his body. All was wondrous, brilliant, unlimited, all expanding. So we can see something of the personal feature, although it's the universal form, still there's forms there that he's wearing garlands and, and garments and there's ornaments and weapons. So these things are very much related to the, some people's bodies. So it's not just impersonal, it's not just some energy, some light. But you can see some personality is there in, in, within the form. All right, someone like to read this for us? If you want to what? If you want to dress somebody, he must be a person. So even in the universal form, there is personality. Divya Malya, Divya Gandha. Kiritina, dressed, well dressed. Well dressed is possible, not in the name person. If you want to dress somebody, he must be a person. You cannot dress in the sky. Here is helmet, here is garment. Where you put. So in the universal form also there is personality. Ah, no. So Prabhupada is arguing logically. Even in the universal form, there is personality. Who is that personality? 
that we have to understand. Yes, someone can read the verse, text 14, chapter 11. Then bewildered and astonished, his face standing on end, Arjuna bowed his head to offer obeisances and with folded hands began to pray to the Supreme God. So this is a significant verse. This is one of our objectives. We, we want to appreciate the change which is taking place in Arjuna. That Arjuna, initially Arjuna and Krishna are friends. And we hear also Lord Krishna saying that he selected Arjuna Bhaktosi me sakacheti because you're my devotee as well as my friend. And so Arjuna was a friend of Krishna. He had that friendly relationship, Sakyaras. But here it's a little different because Rista Roma, the hair his hair standing on end. Vishamaya Vishto Rista Roma Dananjaya. The, what's happened here? And Arjuna, it, it, it's not like a friendly relationship. Arjuna is bowing his head to offer obeisances with folded hands and he's praying to Krishna. So the relationship has changed and it's not friendship anymore. What's, what kind of relationship is it now? It's one of the indirect rasas. Anyone like to make a guess? What kind of rasa? What's the mood? It's a Dasharas Maharaj. No, uh, it's one of the indirect rasas. Santaras. I think it is a Wonder Maharaj. Yes, Surprise that's Wonder. right. Wonder. Wonder and astonishment. Wonder and astonishment. That's the rasa that Arjuna is just amazed, you know? Why is he so amazed? What happened? What happened to cause him to change? Still now whom he considered his friend, now he realizes that uh, he's the lord of all the universes. Yes, yes. Because why, how did he understand Krishna was the Lord of the universe? After seeing the Vishwarupa? Yes, he saw the Vishwarupa, right. He saw that universal form. He saw the form of the Lord. How it, everything in the universe is actually his. So the relationship changed. Arjuna bowed his head, offered obeisances, began to pray. So the, this is significant change in the rasa. Now Krishna enjoys all these different rasas. He was, actually he enjoys friendship. And this rasa, this rasa of being, you know, uh, astonished, it's not going to last. But it, it's due to the Vishwarup, because Arjuna was seeing that universal form and he was seeing how this is the Lord. He was understanding about the, something of the potency of the Lord. Previously, Krishna had spoken it. He'd already said, Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo. But now you, Arjuna is actually seeing everything coming from Krishna. He's actually seeing that it's all Krishna's energy, everything. So it's one thing to hear about it, to speak it, but when you actually see it, then it's a very different thing. It's a, that's a big change. And that is what bewildered and astonished Arjuna. And that caused the change in him. Right? Well, go ahead. Right? Someone like to read for us, please? 
BG Purport 11.14. Once the divine vision is revealed, the relationship between Krishna and Arjuna changes immediately. Before, Krishna and Arjuna had a relationship based on friendship. But here, after the revelation, Arjuna is offering obeisances with great respect. And with folded hands, he is praying to Krishna. He is praising the universal form. Thus, Arjuna's relationship becomes one of wonder rather than friendship. Here, Arjuna was inspired by the relationship of wonder and in that wonder, although he was by nature very sober, calm and quiet, he became ecstatic. His hair stood up and he began to offer his obeisances unto the Supreme Lord with folded hands. He was not, of course, afraid. He was affected by the wonders of the Supreme Lord. The immediate context is wonder. His natural loving friendship was overwhelmed by wonder. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. The immediate context is wonder. His natural loving friendship was overwhelmed by wonder. And thus he reacted in this way. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. So this is the explanation the change in the rasa between Arjuna and Krishna. So, here's a little exercise we can think about. Arjuna was overwhelmed by seeing the universal form of Krishna. Can anyone remember a time when they were overwhelmed by awe and wonder? What was it like? Was it a humbling experience? How was the cause? of the occurrence connected, if at all, with Krishna. What did you learn from that experience? Any volunteers to share their experience with the rest of the class? Have you ever been overwhelmed by awe and wonder? Maybe when you go in the TOVP, when we open the new temple of the Vedic planetarium, maybe at that time you'll be overwhelmed with awe and wonder. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Sridhar Prabhupada. May I share my experience, Guru Maharaj? Yes, please do, Sri Devi. In 2011, that's the first time I went to uh, Mayapur and uh, when the bell rang at, um, at uh, 3 a.m. Uh, in Gadabhavan and uh, asking us all to wake up and I already set our alarm clock and then uh, I, I woke up and then um, I, I quickly got ready and I rushed to the temple. Uh, when I went there, I, I, as I was walking, just a few people were walking because it was very dark and it was very cold. But when I, it was in December the 28th. So when I, when I reached 20, December the 21st, but when I reached the temple, I was really in awe and wanted to see tiny babies, little children, so many people had woken up so early. They were already there before me, waiting so anxiously for Mangala Aradi to begin. So that was a real eye-opener for me that how these ladies got tiny babies and children all ready, wearing sweaters, all these babies and old ladies and uh, uh, all sorts of devotees were there. So it was a very humbling experience for me and it was connected to Krishna. It made me realize that how anxious devotees are and how I must really emulate these devotees, lovely devotees. Oh. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Th thank you so much. That's very nice. <laughs> a very nice experience. I was also thinking my, my experience like that when I... When I first went to the temple, I went to the temple in London uh, when I, before I became a devotee, it was 1971. Uh, and so I went to the temple and, you know, it was just awe-inspiring. It was built like the, the devotee who had done the work was actually one of the very first disciples of Prabhupada named Shamsundar Prabhu. So he had brought wood with him from America, he would brought this special timber and he used it to con construct the inside of the temple room and he made it something, it looked like 
like an ark, like Noah's ark or something, you know. It was amazing. But what was even more amazing was when they opened the curtains and they had the deities of Radha, Landa, and Ishwara. And they were just so overwhelming. It was so dazzling, so beautiful, so amazing. All the, the colors and the light and the, it was just so attractive. It was, and then at the same time they were playing the recording of Prabhupada chanting, Chintamani Prakar, you know, he was chanting the Brahma Samhita. The whole thing was just so mystical. I was just overwhelmed. So, as you say, it's also humbling. I was seeing the devotees, how they came in and how they would bow down and recite prayers. And like, you know, I'd never seen anything like this in my life. People bowing down on the floor and like that. It was just it was so amazing. I just, I couldn't, I just didn't know what was going on. So what did I learn from that experience? Well, I learned that, you know, I have a lot to learn. There's so many things I don't know. So I was happy to learn from the devotees. Okay, anybody else like to share any experience? Um, Maharaj, you know, this is uh, something uh, when I went to Grand Canyons recently, uh, Grand Canyons, Smoky Mountains, when we see the, when I saw the uh, beauty of this nature, natural wonders, you know, I immediately felt that uh, Krishna said, you know, all this beauty that we see in this world uh, is just a spark of splendor. So when I saw this, I was thinking, you know, how beautiful Krishna must be, how great he must be. This is, this is like insignificant, whatever we are seeing in this world. You know the beauty, the sky, the stars. Sometimes you know the beautiful clouds. Um, so if, if this itself is so beautiful for us, how beautiful Krishna must be. So that uh, that really uh, made me wonder about uh, Krishna's opulences uh, right there. Mm. And yeah, when we think about all these things, you know, we are like very very tiny, insignificant, and we feel you know we are great. <laughs> that is something from there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Very nice. Yes, the wonders of nature. We have to see it in relation to Krishna. Yes? Uh, I have, uh, when I joined first uh, in my uh, yatra in uh, the Bhakti, the process of Bhakti, uh, first year I attended Ratha Yatra and uh, at the time uh, the late night services were done and again I have seen morning chanting program Many devotees who attended late night uh, activities, they are all attended the mo early morning chanting by 4 o'clock suddenly. So all were uh, very enthusiastically uh, being a role model in the Yatra to other newcomers or anyone. And they are actually doing so many service in the late night, but still morning again they, they wake up early and they started the Japa. So really surprising to see the time schedules, how they are managing their work, the spiritual and the material world, uh, the spiritual activities and the material activities, the balancing is really very challenging for many people. But still they are performing the, uh, all the spiritual activities and uh, again balancing it by chanting, by waking up early in the morning and uh, like really it is uh, the time management is really wonderful. Yes, right. Yeah, one devotee told me also, one devotee, he, come, he, he was from Malaysia and he came to visit the temples in the Holy Dham, like Mayapur and Vrindavan. So he told me how wonderful it was that Prabhupada had organized everything. He said, oh, it, the temple program is so regulated, exactly at 4.30 in the morning, they're blowing the conch shell and opening the curtains. He said, you go to other temples, you know, other temples, they're always, you know, everything is so late and there's no, there's no proper schedule and things gradually yes, happen. Nearby my village, they open the temples by 7 or 8 o'clock morning only. After 8 o'clock, they are opening the temples. But, I have seen only in our Sambhutaya, they are uh, regular in their time schedules. Right. Yeah, the, so the devotee was, he was glorifying Prabhupada. He said, what a miracle that he's done. He's, you know, the standards he set, so wonderful. So it's, it's very inspiring. 
It's also very inspiring, Mayapur, to see all the people come in the morning to chant. People even traveling the whole night just to come for Mongol Arti. Hey Krishna Maharaj, uh, yeah. I would also like to share, like, uh, even I had these inspiring, many inspiring occasions, you know, wherein we see, uh, you know, on Janamashtami, uh, the devotees are there in the temple till, you know, midnight, till one o'clock, and, uh, you know, even the next day, they are up, uh, you know, uh, for the Mangal Arati. So, that really surprises me. I mean, how could they do it? One o'clock they are here and uh, the next day four o'clock again they will be here. Mm. So I could never, I could never manage that. So that is really inspiring. Mm. Uh, but when it comes to even wondering, so uh, it, the experience in even wondering is by reading Shri Bhagavatam. So whenever I read Shri Bhagavatam, especially the, the you know the chapters which talk about the creation, so how the material world was created, you know that is really I mean I get absorbed in it. I don't know what happens. No, that's already wonderful. So that is the experience of even wonderful. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. Thank but you very much. Very nice to hear these experiences from our devotees. We'll go ahead. Verses 26 to 27. All the sons of Dhritarashtra, along with their allied kings and Bhishma, Drona, Karna, and our chief soldiers also are rushing into your fearful mouths. And some, I see, trapped with heads smashed between your teeth. So, we're hearing, we're, this is the description of the form of time, the Kala root is being described. Krishna himself will describe, <laughs> as we see here. Krishna says, time I am, and you just become my instrument. So there's the verse. Oh, that's not actually the verse I was thinking of, right? The real verse is, Nimitta Matra Bhava Savya Sachin. Or would someone like to read this verse for us? This is verse number 32. Hey Krishna Maharaj, can you? Yes, please. Shri Bhagavan Vacha, Kalo Asmi Loko Kshaya Krit Prabhato, Lokan Samahartum Ta Prabhata, Te Api Tvam Na Bhavishyam Te Sarve, Te Avastita Pratyan Keshu Yodaha. The Supreme Personality of God had said, Time I am. The great destroyer of the worlds, and I have come here to destroy all people with the ex exception of you, the Pandavas. All the soldiers here on both sides will be slain. Mm. So, this is Lord Krishna's prophecy. This, well, Arjuna had asked, Who are you? Right? Arjuna had asked that question. Let me. Oh, that was uh, text number. Mm. When, when Arjuna saw the, the form, I see trapped between your mouth, that was text number 26. And then, I've got, as the many waves of the river flow into the ocean, so do all these great warriors enter into your blazing mouths. I see all people rushing full speed into your mouth as moths dash to destruction in a blazing fire. O Vishnu, I see you devouring all people from all sides with your flaming mouths, covering all the universe with your effulgence. You are manifest with terrible scorching rays. O Lord of Lords, so fierce of form, please tell me who you are. I offer my obeisances unto you. Please be gracious to me. You are the primal Lord. I want to know about you, for I do not know 
what your mission is. So this was Arjuna's inquiry to the Lord and we read verse number 32 which was how the Lord replied to Arjuna's inquiry. The Lord is describing, he said, uh, who he is? He said, I, time, I am time. Is Krishna time? Is it, would you, would you agree with that? Krishna is yes. time? Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, can I have your questions? Yes. Maharaj, so uh, here Arjuna has uh, uh, seen the uh, anything, what is the end of the war? But has he seen uh, the things which is going to end uh, beyond the war, like uh, end of Leela of Krishna on this uh, earth, and then uh, uh, this all the Pandavas are uh, uh, rejecting their kingdom and going to the Himalayas and leaving the body. So has he watched all that? Because that is somewhere like uh, it's a uh, it's it's a kind of uh, uh, leaving behind. Uh, everything which they are getting out of war. Uh, so, so has he also seen those things where this end of Leela of Krishna and the end of uh, this all the five Pandvas? Well, no, because that's going to come some time after. This is not going to happen right away, right? What's shown here is what's going. What's the outcome of the battle? Remember, this, this is all taking place on the battlefield at Kurukshetra. So the Lord wants to encourage Arjuna in fighting the battle. He's not just showing him the future. Of course, it's, we, everybody knows we're going to die and some, the, the, our end is also going to come. But the immediate issue was the battle. So Lord Krishna wants to encourage Arjuna to fight the battle. So he shows him the universal form and he shows a particular aspect of the universal form indicating the outcome of the battle. And he's telling him, with the exception of you, the Pandavas, all the soldiers here on both sides will be slain. Actually, there were a few others also who survived, not just only the Pandavas. There were a few others, not a lot but some. So, yeah, I mean, later on the Pandavas are going, that's going to, that will be some time later. That won't be until Lord Krishna finishes his pastimes and he concludes his Leela in this world. And then the Pandavas go to Himalayas. But that's not going to happen for a while. Right now the issue is this battle of Kurukshetra. Lord Krishna wants to encourage the Arjuna, that he, he wants to show Arjuna what's going to happen. So Arjuna can be confident to go out and fight. So, uh, Maharaj, one, one question here with respect to uh, Krishna showing the universal form and you know, all, the, all the great warriors. Krishna says in text 34 that all the great warriors have already been destroyed by me. So how do we understand when Krishna is saying they have already been destroyed? That is one question. And number two, if I know the future, that this is what is going to happen, all the enemies are going to be destroyed, how one gets inspired to fight? Because I already know that they are going to die. So how do I get inspired if you know the future? Well, that's going to, that's going to come in the next verse when Krishna will tell Arjuna, just become an instrument in my service. Yeah. Right? It's not that Krishna is going to do it all, but Arjuna has to become the instrument in the service of Krishna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel, I feel that sometimes it's, it's very, very, <laughs> very difficult because, you know, Krishna is saying they are all died, they are, they are all destroyed. <laughs> now, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, the outcome of the war, outcome of the task, it becomes you know, challenging to uh, get inspired. So I was just thinking about. It. Well, it's just like Lord Chaitanya's mission, you know. Uh, prob you know, the message of Lord Chaitanya is going to go all over the world. So, who's going to do it? 
it's already predicted the holy name spreading going to spread all over the world it was just a question of who's going to do it who wants to get the credit who's going to do it nobody nobody wanted to do it until Prabhupada went around the world and distributed the holy name so, so similarly he, on the battle of Kurukshetra these people, they were all going to die. Uh, everybody, both sides. But Arjuna has to be, there has to be an inst he has to be the instrument. So Arjuna, Arjuna was puzzled. He'd seen the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He'd seen various forms shown by Krishna. So he asked about what is what is your actual mission? He wanted to know about what, what, is it, what is your mission? What are you trying to do? Because in the Vedas it also says that the Supreme Truth destroys everything, even the Brahmanas. So all the Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, everyone else, they're all devoured by the Supreme Lord. So that form, that Kala Rup, this form of the Supreme Lord, this is the, the, the all-devouring giant. And Krishna is showing himself in that form as all-devouring time. So only the few devotees like the Pandavas will, will survive. Everyone else will be destroyed. Arjuna, he, didn't, he, he wasn't willing to fight in the beginning. He thought better not to fight. But Krishna is saying, even if you don't fight, every one of them, they're going to die. Because the Lord had his plan. And if Arjuna stopped fighting, they would die another way. There's no way they could avoid death. As Krishna said, they're, all, they're already dead. <laughs> right? from, from the time we take birth, we're dead. We take birth, we're dead. We're not 30 years old, we're 30 years dead. So that time is destruction. Uh, Maharaj, can you ask one more question? Okay. Uh, like uh, normally we say that uh, Kshatriyas are supposed to uh, fight in the battle, but here, of course, Shudras also participates uh, uh, as a uh, soldier. Uh, but uh, all the Rathis and Maharathis are uh, Kshatriyas. But here we find that uh, Brahmanas are also participating in uh, war. So is it that only very selected Brahmana who was all so trained in military science, they are only participating or all the Brahmanas are also participating uh, in the war. And if in case all the Brahmanas are also uh, going to participate in the war and everybody is going to kill, then subsequently what uh, uh, Krishna says that only those evil people are going to be uh, uh, finished in this war and then again when we are, uh, when, when a distant Maharaj is going to rule, then for doing the regular karma kanda you require a brahmana so from where the brahmana is going to come in that case well yeah not all the of, of, there was only people like drona who were brahmanas who became took part in the war uh, drona, drona and who was the other acharya kripacharya kripacharya yeah acharya mm -hmm. So a few brahmanas, not many, not that all brahmanas fought, fought in the war, just a few. And was it applicable to, to Vaishyas also, or Vaishyas are not supposed to participate? No, 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 the Vaishyas don't fight there. That's not their, their profession. <laughs> no, it's meant for Kshatriyas, right? The, the religious war, Dharma Yud, they should be Kshatriyas, they should be trained, they've come there to fight. That was the nature of the Dharma Yud. And that these people were Kshatriyas and they came there prepared, pre look and happy to give up their life on the battlefield. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Maharaj, even the soldiers, they are also Kshatriyas, right? Yes, I think so. I, I never heard any Sudras going to fight there. 
There are, there, there's, there wouldn't be Maharatis, of course, like people like the Pandavas and so on, they're all Maharatis. But the other soldiers, they're just ordinary Kshatriyas. And just like demigods, you know, you have principal demigods and you have ordinary demigods. They're not all so on the same level. And so the same way you have Kshatriyas, you have big powerful Kshatriyas, Maharatis, and you have others who are just like soldiers, common soldiers. And even you have chariot drivers, of course you have chariot drivers there, like Sudras, so they're there. They said the chariot driver is the position of, like, of a Sudra. So there are some Sudras there, they're not actually fighting, but they're driving the chariot, they have some service. Okay, so let's go ahead. See what we have here. Yes, someone like to read this for us? Bhagavad Gita Purport 11.32 Eventually, all the Brahmanas, Kshatriyas and everyone else are devoured like a meal by the Supreme. This form of the Supreme Lord is the all-devouring giant. And here Krishna presents himself in that form of all-devouring time. Except for a few Pandavas, everyone who was present on that battlefield would be devoured by him. Arjuna was not in favor of the fight and he thought it was better not to fight. Then there would be no frustration. In reply, the Lord is saying that even if he did not fight, every one of them would be destroyed, for that was his plan. If Arjuna stopped fighting, they would die in another way. Death could not be checked, even if he did not fight. In fact, they were already dead. Time is destruction and all manifestations are to be vanquished by the desire of the Supreme Lord. That is the law of nature. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Okay, going ahead, text 33. Here we have the... Okay. Tashmatva muktishta yashoda vashva jitva shatrum bhumshva rajyam samradham mayai paite nikata purvam eva nimitta matram bhavasa vyasachi Therefore, get up, prepare to fight and win glory. Conquer your enemies and enjoy a flourishing kingdom. They are already put to death by my arrangement and you, O Sapya Sashi, can be but an instrument in the fight. Yes. So, Sapya Sashi, meaning one who is very expert in firing arrows. He said he could fire with both hands left hand or right hand, you could fire in the dark even. We know Arjuna was very expert, he won the hand of Draupadi by his archery skill, that he could pierce the eye of the fish. So Lord Krishna is inspiring him, get up, prepare to fight and win glory, conquer your enemies and enjoy a kingdom. <laughs> The Lord is, is trying to inspire Arjuna, go out there, go in the battle, get into it. They're already put to death by my arrangement. You can be but an instrument in the fight. So Lord Krishna wants to encourage Arjuna to get the glory, win glory. Material life, material world, people are eager for glory. Politicians, sportsmen, any person, whatever endeavor they're in, if they can do it successfully, they get glory for their enjoyment, for their satisfaction. So Lord Krishna wants to encourage Arjuna because Arjuna didn't want to fight. But the Lord hopes that knowing that they're definitely going to win and that he's going to survive, then Arjuna should be more confident to go out there and take part in this battle. Yes, someone please read this section. That is the beauty of the Lord's dealing with his devotees. Sometimes the Lord gives more credit to his devotees than he takes for himself. For instance, on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Lord Krishna fought simply by giving directions. 
Yet it was Arjuna who took the credit for fighting. Nimitta Matram, Baba Savya Sachin, you, you, all Savya Sachi, Arjuna, can be but an instrument in the fight. Bhagavad Gita 11.33 Everything was arranged by the Lord, but the credit of victory was given to Arjuna. Similarly, in the Krishna conscious movement, everything is happening according to the predictions of Lord Chaitanya, but the credit goes to Lord Chaitanya's sincere servants. Srimad Bhagavatam 4.24 45 to 6. Thank you. Thank you, Melody. Yes. So, everyone, <laughs> we should just be sincere servants in Lord Chaitanya's movement. Prabhupada said, everything is happening according to the predictions of Lord Chaitanya. Right? I was telling, Lord Chaitanya said, Nagaradi Gram, the holy name would be chanted every. So, who was going to do it? And Prabhupada used to preach to us like that. He would talk to devotees like that. Give this life to Krishna, he would okay. say. So give this one life to Krishna. We've already had so many lives in the material world. Why not just give this one life to Krishna? And you can get so much glory. You can, it can be your, to your credit to do something for Krishna. Another exercise. Discuss a time when you became Krishna's instrument and accomplished a task that was ordinarily beyond your capability. What happened? How did you feel? What general principles can you draw from your experience? Any volunteers? Did you become Krishna's instrument and do something wonderful? Something ordinarily which is beyond our capability? Have you had that opportunity to do something for Krishna? Yes. Yes, Prabhu? Actually, uh, I am uh, here in the Middle East and I am working, today is working there actually. Uh, after my office work, uh, I am taking one Gurukul class also, who is, uh, uh, whom they are attending on Sunday also. So, after my uh, work finished by this time, by this uh, this country's time is 4 o'clock, 4 to 5.30 I am having a Gurukul class and 5.30 to 7.30 I am having a uh, Bhakti Shastri class. So in between I have to travel from college to here and initially I felt the struggle but later I arranged one more Mataji to take care of the class for the sloka readings for the Gurukul children and after work I am completely sitting up to from morning 8 o'clock until night 7.30 or 8, I will still sit for our class. So Krishna made me to practice used to this now. So every Sunday morning 8 to night 8, fully packed with office work, then Gurukul class in between, then our class. So now I feel very like a leisure. Initially it was very difficult to tackle, but after that now it is becoming like I, I think I used to this. So. It is uh, flexible now. Yeah, when you finish the course, you'll miss it, right? When you finish... <laughs> yes, yes, no. <laughs> you'll yes, marriage. It's true that, that while we're doing it, we're thinking, oh, you know, <laughs> in the beginning especially, we think, oh, I don't know if I can do it. But if you keep doing it, you become, you, it, it becomes pleasurable. Yeah. But initially I felt difficult, but now it is like uh, I want to attend all, so I didn't want to miss anything. So I arranged some other uh, thing and I do it. Yes, you're getting the higher taste. Very nice. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. I would like to share an experience. Like, you know, uh, we, got, we got into Krishna consciousness like uh, when seven years ago when my daughter was born. So we were into Krishna consciousness little and when my son was born like three years back, 
So we completely got into Krishna consciousness, and I mean uh, that kept on increasing. Now, why do I say that we became the or I became the instru an instrument? Uh, somehow I feel that you know my children. I think they were Krishna consciousness. It is it was Krishna's plan to you know bring into the family. So you know the pitch was getting ready for them. So somehow we feel that you know these are Krishna's children, and because they have to be Krishna consciousness, we have to give them platform. So everything became ready. So. Otherwise, I got in touch with the, you know, Iskon 15 years back, but that time I didn't come properly into Krishna consciousness. But right now, you know, when these children had to come, gradually we got into and we didn't even get to know what happened to us. I mean, so that is why I felt that it was completely Krishna's plan. Uh, that's it, Maharaj. Okay, Krishna brought you back more into the Krishna conscious movement, huh? Yes, ma'am. By giving you the two children. Yes, ma'am. Very good. Maharaj, I would like to share my own experience. Yes, please, Prabhu. Yeah. So that was somewhere around uh, this uh, October 1984, where I was hardly 16 and a half and uh, join a technological university which is uh, considered to be one of the toughest exam and one of the premier institution that is called IIT Kanpur and, and, and that's a place of material where uh, the entire batch dream is to graduate from there and go to US because that used to be considered the passport to US and join and uh, multinationals so that used to be the dream of all the uh, students and that was the time we had first exposure and we never had we had different societies but not uh, 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 bhakti vedanta or anything related with this con and that was the time where we had one uh, uh, lecture by one of the devotees who was in us who graduated from another very reputed university from india at the age of 50 very successful uh, running it company at the age of 50 and he surrendered everything and he became the director of bhakti vedanta institute at uh, mumbai and he, he delivered a lecture that quantum physics and its uh, uh, impact on how many of the unsolved problems we can solve uh, the, through uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this from, from uh, Vedanta philosophy. And so that was the eye opening and then we have started this activity and then two, three months after uh, Pithu Prabhu started visiting us and guiding us and from there we established the center and the effect was that now many of the graduate students were joining over there and after graduation they are straight away taking a Ajivan Brahmachari. So now it has become established systems and that was the time many of the people who graduated become professor in different other reputed universities and they set up a full-fledged center. So now all the premier institutions in India, we have some of the devotees from those batch who, was, who is leading the congregations and this was definitely not possible by a, a one small initiative but now it, uh, Krishna with Krishna Marshi uh, now almost all the uh, this Indian University and the, wherever they have gone in US now they are completely committed and devoted devoted to Krishna consciousness so this is a small beginning and of course very inspiring uh, uh, these lessons and guidance from Pithu Prabhu who, who has kept on guiding us all along. So that was a very uh, uh, eye-opening, uh, overwhelming experience for us at the age of uh, mere 16 and 17 and which has led to so many devotees establishing a different centers across the world. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. Yes, certainly India is really you know, when we look at the centers in India, we can really feel this is a, a success story. <laughs> you know, I came to India in 1970, uh, 1975, I, I came to India. And so Prabhupada had begun the movement like 1971, brought the devotees first of all to India. So in 75, we had very little development. There was a small rented house in Delhi and, and Mumbai 
we were, we were, the temple was all everything. There was there was construction. Well, the construction had wasn't even going on in seventy five. It was just uh, we were just living on the roof of the the houses which were on the property. There were tenants living in the houses on the property, and we were living on the roof of these houses, which were occupied by the tenants. And that was in Mumbai. In, in Mayapur, we had the Lotus Building. Hmm. So it, it, it had a slope. It, we had a, you know, a very small beginning. But when we look now at the temples everywhere, and, oh my goodness, and, and the number of devotees, and even, in, of course, in Prabhupada's time, there were not a lot of Indian devotees. There were very less number. We were very much a foreigner movement. But now, we can see how the local people have taken to Krishna consciousness and they've really embraced it. And, of course, the devotees of the, the temples are all manned by the local devotees. And there's not much impact of the foreigners at all. The presence of the foreigners is greatly reduced. But so many more temples and so many more devotees. So it's really a wonderful success story. With many temples, many devotees. And we hope that they will continue like that to expand and keep the standards and, and encourage the preaching to go on. Of course, things change. We do, you were talking about how many young people were joining the movement pre to his time. Now, of course, it's not so easy to get the students. And you have to think of different ways to preach. Nowadays, you don't have access to go on the campus as you did in the past. And the colleges are very worried about losing students to our movement and to other similar movements and they really do try to protect the students because the students are their customers <laughs> and we're taking their customers away so they don't like it so we have to always be looking for new fields and new strategies to continue preaching and to develop the Krishna Consciousness Movement. You can never sit back and think, oh, we've done enough, now it's all done, and everything is set up. No, you, you have to always be going forward and thinking how to develop more, bring more people into Krishna Consciousness. Okay, so that was text 33, here's text 34. Who would like to read the verse? Dronam cha, Bishmam cha, Jayatatam cha, Karnam tathanyan api yoga vira, Maya tatam tam jahi maya tishta, Yudhyasva jeta sirene sapatna, Drona, Bishma, Jayatrata, Karna, and the other great warriors have already been destroyed by me. Therefore, kill them and do not be disturbed. Simply fight and you will vanquish your enemies in battle. So Lord Krishna is encouraging Arjuna, simply fight and you will, you're going to vanquish your enemies. So this is Lord Krishna's desire. He wants to see Arjuna active. So he showed him the Kala Rup, how they were going to win. And we go on, next section, we'll hear Arjuna's prayers. Arjuna is going to respond because Krishna had been speaking to Arjuna telling Arjuna, become an instrument in my service. All of these people are already put to death. You just have to be the instrument. All right? So here's text 41. Very nice verse. Who would like to read this one? Sri Devi, you can read this. Shakyati matva prasabhavu yat bhuktam Hey Krishna, He Yadava, He Shakyati, Ajanata Mahimanam Tavedam, Maya Pramad, Pramadat Pranayena Papi, Bhagavad Gita 11.41. Thinking of you as my friend, I freshly addressed you 
O Krishna, O Yadava, O my friend, not knowing your glories, please forgive whatever I may have done in madness or in love. I have dishonored you many times, jesting as we relaxed, lay on the same bed or sat or ate together, sometimes alone and sometimes in front of many friends. O oh, infallible one, please excuse me for all those offenses. Uh -huh. So Arjuna wants to offer his uh, prayers to Lord Krishna and he begins asking Lord Krishna to forgive him and he describes how Arjuna had been very familiar with Lord Krishna because as we said previously before this vision of the universal form they were friends and so Arjuna said I I've dishonored you many times, jesting as we relaxed, lay on the same bed, or sat to eat together. And we're going to hear about the significance of this uh, Hey Krishna, Hey Yadava, Hey Saketi. Because this, this is uh, the point that Arjuna feels that uh, he was being offensive by using these terms to address Lord Krishna. And it's explained here. Someone please read this one. Srila Vishwanathi Thakura explains that Arjuna is lamenting his previous over familiar relationship with Krishna. For example, he would usually call Krishna Krishna and not the um, more honorific Sri Krishna. Um, Arjuna's referring, uh, referring to Krishna as Krishna also indicates that Krishna is the son of Vasudeva, who was merely a minister, whereas Arjuna's father Pandu was a great warrior. Similarly, Arjuna, a member of the royal Pandava um, dynasty, would refer to Krishna as Yadava, a member of a family uh, unable to rule. Furthermore, Arjuna would at times say, Oh my friend, um, as uh, if being con uh, condescending kind. Although I am superior to you, out of my affection I accept you as my friend. Now aware of Krishna's actual position, Arjuna feels ashamed and begs forgiveness. Yes. So, this is the significance of these terms. Hey, hey Krishna. Instead of Sri Krishna, he's just saying, hey Krishna, not very honorific, but it's bet much more polite to say, Sri Krishna, Lord Sri Krishna, or at least Sri Krishna. And then we're told also, by using the term Krishna, it's relating to Vasudev. Vasudev wasn't a Maharati. Arjuna's father was a great Maharati, but Vasudeva was just like a politician. He, he, he could talk, but he didn't fight. He didn't go to Kurukshetra. He wasn't fighting. He was a more just politician, good talker. So, Arjuna was like mocking Krishna that, oh, you're just, you're, your father is, you know, he's just like that. And then he was calling Krishna as Yadava. Hey Krishna, hey Yadava. You, you, oh, you're a Yadava. Yeah, you're a Yadava. The family unable to rule. You don't have any kingdom. You don't have any, any land. How can you rule anything? What kind of, what kind of great family are you? If you don't have a kingdom, how can you be a king? And then, hey Saketi, hey Saketi, it means, oh my friend. Krishna, uh, Arjuna is being thinking, he's thinking, Arjuna is thinking, I'm being nice to him, I'll let him be my friend. But it's actually Arjuna who is lucky to be the friend of Krishna. Arjuna was thinking in his ignorance that, oh, Krishna is so lucky he can be my friend. I'll let Krishna be my friend. So this was, of course, Yoga Maya acting on Arjuna. 
that he could behave like this. Because in some ways Arjuna did know Lord Krishna's position. And it's a very nice prayer offered by Arjuna, very significant how he uses these words. People like to memorize prayers, they often memorize the part of these, these words, these prayers of Arjuna. All right, now you have to, you, have to need, you need a partner, it should be in pairs, and you should ask, Arjuna begged forgiveness for offenses that he committed out of ignorance. Do we sometimes commit offenses out of ignorance, especially when we were new devotees? Share some remembrances of such times and what we can learn from such experience. All right? Do, who, who, can someone put devotees into pairs? Give everyone a partner? And you can... Uh, were you talking to me, Prabhu? Yeah, I create a breakout room, sir, Maharaj. Okay, Prabhu, yes, please.
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Did you did you come up with some example? Yeah, Maharaj. We were discussing uh, when we were new in the moment at that time. Uh, we went to Detroit Temple, and then there is one devotee standing behind us, and he was checking. He was planning to move to Columbus. We are from Ohio, Columbus. So we went to uh, some program in Detroit. We went. We were standing in the line to do some uh, bathing for Jagannath. So the line was so long that it's like taking forever. It's not moving. And then uh, they, they saw one devotee who is inquiring about Columbus because he's planning to move to Columbus. And he was inquiring about Prasad. All the time he was talking about Prasad only. Prasad, Prasad, Prasad. Then my husband is thinking, why is this devotee is always thinking about the Prasad? Do we get the prasadam? When I serve the prasadam, okay, then can I come before the prasadam and all? He was thinking about prasadam, prasadam. Then he's, my husband thought, like, you know, why he's thinking about the, only the prasadam? He's not checking with how much is the congregation, what are the deities' names, nothing. That's what we thought. And then uh, we left it. And then he moved, and then um, he, uh, he, he became a congregation member, and then after that he started preaching, and now he's a, uh, big preacher in Columbus temple. He is one of the temple council member also. And then a lot of people came to know about Islam because of him only. Yeah. So <laughs> then later we realized how ignorant we are. We are judging a person based on the questions that he's asking. But the reason behind his questions is he doesn't want to eat anywhere else. He wants to take only Krishna's prasada, uh -huh. no matter what. Uh -huh. So that was that was his inquiry. Then we felt very uh, ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another, another one is you know, the, one of the biggest offenses, Maharaj, initial days, uh, not understanding the position of spiritual master. When we see spiritual master or sannyasi or sadhu, um, at least I used to take them easily. You know, I did not understand their position. Uh, so. In that sense, you know, I committed mental offenses to that person. As we progress in Krishna consciousness, as we read the scriptures, then I understand that you know, uh, spiritual master is not an ordinary personality. So that is, you know, initial days I definitely committed some mental offenses, not thinking about his speech. But you don't get any reactions for mental offenses. The, there's, there's no reactions. In the Kali Yuga, there's no reactions for mental offenses. But if you think good, you get the benefit in Kali Yuga. <laughs> if you just think, think about doing good, you get benefit. So one more thing, Maharaj. In, it's a very, very new, like, you know, we just started going to the temple. Just started. And then one Maharaj came and all the devotees were, um, like, you know, going again as his Maha. As soon as Maharaj completed his, prasa, his uh, prasadam, honor, honoring prasadam, the plate came out and everybody like you know hopping on that like you know, to, to get the maha. Oh. So I was thinking, why? Why anybody would then and it is it is uh, what do you say that in English? It is uh, it is juta. Juta meaning it is uh, in Greek. Oh. I don't know, it's it's somebody ate in it, right? It is somebody ate it. Somebody ate and then we are trying to hop on that prasadam. And then I was thinking, why? Why? And it did not register. What is the significance? What is the importance of that pure devotee um, remnants. remnants? So later I understood what is what is the meaning and what is the importance and significance of that remnants. <laughs> Initially, very weird for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Recording in progress. Yes, Prabhu, we have to close the rooms. Everybody back. Yes, Maharaj, close the
All right, so did you have a nice discussion? Did we hear some nice examples where we had, uh, where we committed some offenses out of ignorance? Anybody like to share with me what you discussed? We'd like to hear from some devotees. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Yeah, um, we discuss some offenses we commit when we're new. For example, sometimes if we're like when we were when uh, we were new to the temple, we didn't know the formal rules and regulations of the temple. So sometimes we would give, you know, stand our backs to we would face our backs to the deities or take pictures with the deities or talk during. Arthi, so because we were not familiar with the yeah the, right mm. proper etiquette temple etiquette so these were some offenses we committed out of ignorance that were people heavy with you when they were cracking you how did you know how did they deal with you how did they point out not heavy Maharaj but they just pointed out and explain proper etiquette nicely. Oh, okay. Yeah, sometimes, you know, when we're new devotees, maybe, you know, you leave the book on the floor, you put the book on the floor, you put the car towels on the floor, and they say, don't yeah. put them on the floor! <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you don't even sit properly. Yeah, but yeah, you can hear Prabhupada on the tape. He's saying in the tape, he's saying, sit properly. And put that, yeah. Let me put the arms around the legs, you know, it's not proper. Yeah. It's small. Okay, so certainly uh, these things happen. What do we learn from much, such experiences? Well, we, we learn what is the proper behavior, what we should do, right? That's one thing we learn, what is the proper standards, what's the proper behavior, proper, proper etiquette. So, Krishna consciousness is a growing experience, you know, there's, we're always learning. There's so much to learn, there's so many things to be, be understood, it's a whole new life. Learning to eat, you know, I don't know, being brought up in the West, we were not taught about the importance of using the right hand to eat. You know, Prabhupada taught the left hand is to clean the body and the right hand is to put the food in the mouth. But that was not given, that knowledge, that training was not given in the Western society. But it came once we came to Krishna consciousness. So, <laughs> Even now, I, I, I sometimes see devotees and I have to tell them, Prabhu, please, you know, you're a twice initiated devotee and you're using your left hand to eat prasadam. It's not very good, you know. Prabhupada, in Prabhupada's time, you know, we had uh, quite good training. Nowadays, we're, because we're more congregational, so devotees are not together very often, so they don't know so much about you know, they're, they're not so conscious of eating, just using the right hand. There's so many things to be learned. Not putting the instruments on the floor, even the madangas, they should be kept off the ground. We, we were supposed to, Prabhupada wanted racks made to keep the madangas, don't put them on the floor. And of course, there's so many things in dealing with the deities. And flowers should be fresh. If the flowers are not fresh, Prabhupada would not be pleased. He would say, you have no bhava. That's why you offer these old flowers to the deities. And one time somebody put salt in the Charanamrita. 
And Prabhupada would always come and take Charanamrita. And Prabhupada took the Charanamrita and tasted the salt and said, who has put salt in the Charanamrita? And then, you know, some girl came, some woman came who had done it. And Prabhupada just was just disgusted and he just turned to the managers and he said, get someone responsible to do this. Because he saw this, this young woman was not very responsible. So Prabhupada pointed out to the managers, you have to get responsible people to do these things. If they put salt in the charanamrita, it's not good. It's a great it's a offense. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text 46. O universal form, O thousand-armed Lord, I wish to see you in your four-armed form, with helmeted head and with club, wheel, conch and lotus flower on your hands. I long to see you in that form. So which form is this Arjuna wants to see? The two-handed Shamsundara form. No, he's saying, I want to see your form. form. What? Ishvarupa. Huh? The forearm form? The forearm form? Chaturbhuj Yeah, Chaturbhuj. Chaturbhuj, Vishnu, Narayan, right. And with the four symbols of Lord Vishnu, the club, the wheel, the conch, the lotus flower. I want to see you in that form. So why does Arjuna, why would he want to see that form? Why would Arjuna want to see that form, do you think? As all yogis are meditating on that form. Yes, that's true. The yogis meditate on that form. Is that the original form? No, Maharaj, that is not yours. Yes, it, it's... But, uh, it's, it's the original form of Lord Vishnu. Shamasundara Rupa. Prabhupada writes in the purport to this verse, text 46, He's, he quotes the verse from Brahma Samhita, Ramadi Murti Shukala Niyamena And then he says, The Lord is eternally situated in hundreds and thousands of forms. And the main forms are those like Rama, Nusringa, Narayan, etc. There are innumerable forms, but Arjuna knew that Krishna is the original personality of Godhead, Assuming his temporary universal form, right? The universal form is not eternal. So now he is asking to see the form of Narayan. Is that a material form? No, no it's a spiritual form, right? So, so this text 46, <coughs> this, this is going, this is, Arjuna wants to see this form because he, without any doubt about the statement he, that Krishna is the original personality of Godhead and all the other features originate from him. So this four-arm form also originates from Krishna's two-arm form. And Krishna is not different from his different expansions. He is God in any of his forms. In all of these forms, he's fresh like a young man. So one who knows Krishna becomes free from all the contamination of the material world. So Arjuna wants to understand that this forearm form is also coming from Lord Krishna. That he's asking Krishna, he wants to see this forearm form. Someone can read? Oh. Arjuna knew that Krishna is the original personality of Godhead. Assuming his temporary universal form, 
he is now asking you to see the form of Narayana, a spiritual form. This verse establishes without any doubt the statement of the Srimad Bhagavatam that Krishna is the original personality of Godhead and all other features originate from him. He is not different from his plenary ex expansions and he is God in any of his innumerable forms. In all of these forms, he is fresh like a young man. That is the constant feature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One who knows Krishna becomes free at once from all contamination of the material world. Thank you. Yes. So Arjuna wants to see that form. So the final section of this chapter. Only pure devotees can see Krishna's two-armed form. <laughs> Other people, they can, see the, they can see the universal form, they can see the four-armed form, but only pure devotees can see the two-armed form. Text 48 describes. Someone like to read? This is... This is uh, Text 48. Is this still Arjuna's prayers? No, 47 began Krishna speaking. So this is Lord Krishna speaking. O oh, best of the Kuru warriors, no one before you has ever seen this universal form of mind. For neither by studying the Vedas, nor by performing sacrifices, nor by charity, nor by pious activities, nor by severe penances, can I be seen in this form in the material world. Mm. <laughs> okay, so, no material qualification to see this form. It's not enough to study the Vedas or to do sacrifices. Charity is not enough. Pious activities, severe penances, none of these things can qualify us. And we want to see Krishna. We want to see that original form. No one before has ever seen this universal form of mind. So that, the universal form which Krishna showed to Arjuna, this was only shown to a few people. Arjuna could see it. Vyasa, he could see it. Sanjay could see it. Although Sanjay was not there, Sanjay could see it by the grace of Vyasa. So, another statement, someone like to read this one? Police officer firing a revolver. Suppose the boy's father is the police officer. So if the father comes as a police officer firing a revolver, even the child will forget loving father. You see? So naturally the child loves father when he is at home, just like father. Similarly, we love Krishna as he is, Shyam Shundar. The Vishwarup was shown to Arjun to warn the rascal humanity. Because Krishna said, I am God. Imitating Krishna, so many rascals declaring that I am God. Therefore, Arjuna said, please show me your Vishwarup, so that these rascals may also ask him to show his Vishwarup. So if you are God, please show me your Vishwarup. Bhagavad Gita 6.46-47, Los Angeles, February 21, 1969. Okay. So please show me your Vishwarup. So Lord Krishna, uh, he showed Arjuna the forearm form, and then text forty-seven, we see Lord Krishna at Lord Krishna speaking to Arjuna. He said, happily have I shown you by my internal potency this supreme universal form within the material world. 
No one before you has ever seen this primal form, unlimited and full of glaring effulgence. And then Lord Krishna continues. You know, we read the verse, text 48. He said, you, you, you have to be a pure devotee in order to see this form. You can't see it by any material qualification. So you have, we have to become actually pure to see the, this. Arjuna could see it. Of course, Arjuna was a devotee. So he was able to see it. And similarly also Sanjay, like that. But then text 42, we see what happens, what the, the result of seeing that form is that you have been perturbed and bewildered by seeing this horrible feature of mine. Now let it be finished, my devotee, be free again from all disturbances. With a peaceful mind, you can now see the form you desire, all right? What is the form we des Arjuna desired? Arjuna desired to see Krishna in his original form, in his two-armed form. That was the point. Arjuna wanted to see the four-armed form, Krishna showed it. A devotee is not very much interested in the universal form, for it does not enable one to reciprocate loving feelings. Either a devotee wants to offer his respectful, worshipful feelings, or he wants to see the two-handed Krishna form, so that he can reciprocate in loving service with the Personality of Godhead. So this brings us up to text number 50, where Sanjay is speaking to Dhritarashtra, right? Someone like to read the verse? Sanjay Uvacha Ityarjunam Vasudevas Tathal Uttva Swakam Rupam Darsha Yama Sabhuyaha Ashwasa Yama Sacha Bhuta Menam Bhutva Punar Somya Vapur Mahatma Sanjay said to Dhritarashtra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, having spoken thus to Arjuna, displayed his real four armed form and at last showed his two-armed form, thus encouraging the fearful Arjuna. So, Krishna showed first the four-armed form, just like when he appeared as the child of Vasudeva and Devaki. He appeared originally in the four-armed form in the prison house of Kamsa. Then at the request of Devaki, he became an ordinary child with two arms. Vasudeva thought it would be very difficult if he has to show people a child with four arms. So he wanted the Krishna to have the normal form, two-armed form. So Krishna knew Arjuna was not interested in seeing the four-handed form. Arjuna asked to see the four-armed form. Krishna showed him that form and then showed his two-handed form. So when he was present, everyone is attracted by Krishna's form. Krishna is the director of the universe. So he showed his beautiful form and the qualification to see that form. Prabhupada quotes Brahma Samhita, you have to have eyes anointed with the, the salve of love of God. When you have that preem on the eyes, when you have love of God, then you can see Krishna Shamsunda. So, not an easy thing. All right, text number 50, purport. Someone read, please. When Krishna appeared as the son of Vasudeva and Devaki, he first of all appeared as Horam Narayana, but when he was requested by his parents, 
he transformed himself into an ordinary child in appearance. Similarly, Krishna knew that Arjuna was not interested in seeing a four-handed form, but since Arjuna asked to see this four-handed form, Krishna also showed him this form again and then showed himself in his two-handed form. Hare Krishna. Text 52. Please read. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Sudur Darsham Idam Rupam Trishtavan Asiyan Mama Deva Apyasya Rupasya Nityam Darshana Kangshinaha Translation by His Divine Grace Prabhu. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, My dear Arjuna, this form of mind you are now seeing is very difficult to behold. Even the demigods are ever seeking the opportunity to see this form which is so dear. All right, so Arjuna had seen that universal form which was not possible for ordinary people to see. But here in this verse, they use the word about Sudur Darsham, Sudur Darsham, in, in other words, very special vision to see, very special Darshan to see this form of the Lord. So Krishna's two-handed two, two form is even more confidential than the forearm form. Ordinary people may be able to see the universal form. They just need a little bit of devotion. They just need to study the philosophy a little bit, and be a little devotional, and they can see the universal form. They don't need to have a lot of bhakti, just a little bit. But beyond the universal form, then there's a form of Krishna with two hands. And even for demigods like Brahma and Shiva, it's difficult for them to see it. We know when, well, Prabhupada gives the example, when Krishna was in the womb of Mother Devaki in the prison house of Kamsa, the demigods would come to offer prayers. At that time, the Lord was, he was not visible, he was, he was still in the womb. They were waiting to see him. <laughs> so even the demigods like Lord Brahma and Shiva, they desire to see Krishna in his two-armed form. But there's a class of people who cannot understand the two-armed form and they think, because it's a two-armed form, they think Krishna is an ordinary person. The Gyanis, the Mayavadis, and when they see Krishna in the two-armed form, then they think that, you see, he's just like us. He, he takes birth, he dies just like us. They cannot understand the transcendental nature of the Lord. Is it difficult to understand? without being properly trained in Krishna Consciousness. So people have to study the Bhagavad Gita, they have to read the Srimad Bhagavatam, understand the nature of Lord Krishna's birth, that his body is not material. They're, they're just blind. They cannot see the spiritual nature of the Lord's body. So Arjuna, he's not so bewildered like that. Arjuna at least can understand the transcendental nature of Lord Krishna. So Krishna arranges this to cover himself from these non-devotees. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I am never manifest to the foolish and unintelligent. 
my, for them I am covered by my eternal creative potency, yoga maya. So yoga maya acts on the devotees in one way and it acts on the non-devotees in another way. On the devotees, it covers up Krishna to reveal him in one of the rasas. Like Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yasoda, they think of Krishna as their son. But for the non-devotees, they're simply Krishna is just an ordinary person. Very difficult. They think, oh, Krishna took birth, just like we take birth. Krishna died. So here are some points from the verse. Someone like to read? Now hear the word. Where? Go ahead. Bhagavad Gita for Port Level Point 57. Now here the word Sudarsham is used, indicating that Krishna's two-handed form is still more condensed. One may be able to see the universal form of Krishna by adding a little tinge of devotional service to various activities like penances, Vedic study and philosophical speculation. It may be possible, but without a tinge of bhakti, one cannot see that has already been explained. Still, beyond that universal form, the form of Krishna with two hands is still more difficult to see. Even for Still more difficult to see, even for demigods like Brahma and Harsha. Right. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Okay. And then one of the concluding verses, famous verse, probably one of the memorization verses. Someone read? Bhagavad Gita 11.54. My dear Arjuna, only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am, standing before you and can thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. Thank you. So the importance of devotional service. And here's the concluding verse of the Bhagavad, of the chapter 11. Mat karma krin mat paramo mat bhakta sangha varjitaha nirvayar sarva bhuteshu yasamam miti pandava. My dear Arjuna, he who engages in my pure devotional service, free from the contamination of fruit of activities and mental speculation, he who works for me, Krishna, very unstable. He who works for me, who makes me the supreme goal of his life, and who is friendly to every living being, he certainly comes to me. So it's a nice verse. Free from the contamination of fruit of activities and mental speculation, so that's pure devotional service, right? There should be no fruit of activities or mental speculation. Pure devotional service. Anya bila sita sunyam jnana karma janavritam anuko yena krishna no shilanam bhakti uttamam. Rupa Goswami's definition of devotional service means no fruit of activities or mental speculation. Also, works for me. Devotional service means activity. The Prabhupada in the purport talks about Krishna karma, activities for Krishna, working for Krishna, who makes me the supreme goal of his life and who is friendly to every living being. He certainly comes to me. So we're not just friendly to devotees, friendly to everyone, compassionate to everyone. Of course, particularly friendly to devotees. 
Anyone who wants to approach the Supreme of all the personalities of Godhead on the Krishna Loka planet, in the spiritual sky, and be intimately connected with the Supreme Personality of Godhead must take this formula as stated by the Supreme Himself. Therefore, this verse is considered to be the essence of Bhagavad Gita. Which verse? 55. Mat karma krin mat paramo, that verse. So that's the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. Now, oh, someone like to read these things? Krishna herein gives Arjuna five powerful instructions on how to render pure devotional service. By executing these five, five instructions, a devotee can be carried to the Lord. Srila Prabhupada discusses each instruction in his purpose. First, bhakti must be performed purely, mat bhaktaha. The devotee must fully engage in the nine process of devotional service. The only goal is Krishna's service, with no desire for attainment in this world. Second, bhakti must be free from karma and jnana, sangha varjitaha. A devotee should not associate with persons who are not become attracted to anything but pure devotion. A devotee at the same time should not be envious of those who are inimical because the karma of such a person has awarded him that mentality. Devotee should remain disentangled from such a person's karma. Third, the word of bhakta must be for Krishna. Mat karma prit. A devotee should use his energy fully in Krishna's service while remaining detached from the fruits of his work. Fourth, Krishna must be the goal of life. Mat parama. The devotee should remain unattracted to both heavenly and impersonal destination. Fifth, the devotee must be friendly to all, nirvai raha. He must compassionately desire to give Krishna consciousness. Surrender unto me. Thank you so much, Maridi. Very nice. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Okay. From the purport. In summary, the universal form of Krishna, which is a temporary manifestation, and the form of time, which devours everything, and even the form of Vishnu, four-handed, have all been exhibited by Krishna. Thus, Krishna is the origin of all these manifestations. It is not that Krishna is a manifestation of the original Vishwarup or Vishnu. Krishna is the origin of all forms. There are hundreds and thousands of Vishnus, but for a devotee, no form of Krishna is important but the original form, two-handed Shamsundar. In the Brahma Samhita, it is stated that those who are attached to the Shamsundar form of Krishna in love and devotion can see him always within the heart and cannot see anything else. One should understand, therefore, that the purport of this eleventh chapter is that the form of Krishna is essential and supreme. Okay, now we have some little exercises to do. Let's go through these questions together. Well, it says divide into groups. Let's just do, the, do it all together. I think we can manage. First question. Krishna is one of the ten incarnations of Vishnu. True or false? False. False, Maharaj. Everyone agree? Anybody says you, n, true? Anybody know the song, the Das Avatar Stotra? <coughs> anyway, the, if, you, if you know the Das Avatar Stotra or Gita Govinda, Das Avatar Stotra comes from the Gita Govinda, then Krishna is not there as one of the ten incarnations. Balaram is there. 
not Krishna. Why not? Krishna is the source of all incarnation. He's the source. He's not avatar. He's avatari, right? Okay. Next thing. I have personally seen Sando, uh, Sandwich Baba's. I have personally seen Sandwich Baba's universal form. How are we going to deal with this? It's a misleading statement. A misleading statement? How, misleading. Will, how will you reply to this then? Somebody said they've personally seen Sandwich Baba's universal form. Anybody has a response to make to this? Only Krishna could have shown. Well, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. So, so that uh, uh, the person who is saying that he has personally seen Sandwich Baba's universal form, we have to check his credibility and credentials because it is only shown to the limited persons like Arjuna, uh, uh, Sanjaya, Vyas Deva. So until unless he is not of that category, how he can claim that uh, uh, God has, uh, uh, Krishna has given him uh, that power to see the universal form. So, so we can check it from that point of view. Okay, we can tell him, go and see a psychiatrist. <laughs> go, go and see the psychiatrist and just check you're not crazy, you know. That's one thing we could try. Okay, next one. I do not personally claim to be God, but my followers do. And I must accept whatever they offer me with love. It's not what they offer, but the fact that they do it with love that makes me obliged. How about that? What do you think of that kind of statement, you know? Well, I don't claim to be God. It's my followers. They, 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 do, they tell me, they say, God, I'm God. So, you know, I should just accept it. They are in ignorance, Maharaj, so they, their knowledge is not perfect. And that is why they come to you uh, as a master, as a guide. And if you don't guide them, so they may have their concoctions. Both yes. yourself yes. and your followers, yes, both yourself and your followers will go to hell if you don't tell them the truth. Okay. The spiritual teacher should tell them the truth, right? We say the spiritual teacher opens the eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. And so, why is he allowing his disciples to be in darkness? What did Prabhupada do when the devotees were claiming that he was God? When somebody said to Prabhupada that uh, he becomes God, Prabhupada said that person needs to become the Lord. One should never say that. All the spiritual masters are considered to be a representative of Krishna, but he is not equal to Krishna. So he should be considered uh, as a servant of the Lord, not Lord himself. Mm -hmm. Yes, good. Uh, there was a case within our movement in the early years where some devotees were claiming that Prabhupada was actually God. Do you, did you hear about that? If you read the history, yes, yes, no, what did Prabhupada do? Prabhupada got angry and he said uh, the disciples should not repeat such things and they should never say that the true master is God. Yeah, Prabhupada actually, he, he put them out of the movement. He got rid of them. <laughs> he said, go. He gave some, some of them, he, he, gave, he gave them sannyas, 
And he said, now you go on your own. You go alone and preach. Don't go to any of our temples. You just go to travel and preach. That was the punishment. Prabhupada sent them out to preach. He didn't want them to associate and pollute the minds of the devotees. They were actually saying Prabhupada was God. And so Prabhupada put, he told them that you can't, I don't want you to associate with the devotees anymore. Go, you go, you gave them dandas, he told them you're sannyasis, go and preach. Make some, try to make a temple somewhere. And they did, they actually did, they were quite successful, they were sincere, and they repented. So that was one example. Certainly the, the spiritual master is responsible for the behavior of the disciples. And if the disciples don't do things properly, then the spiritual master will take the reactions. Just like sometimes people would complain to Prabhupada. They would complain to Prabhupada that the, this devotee forced me to buy a book. They forced me to give donation. And Prabhupada would apologize to them and say, I'm very sorry. He said, but you have to understand these devotees have sacrificed everything for the service of Krishna. And they're very dedicated and very enthusiastic to propagate Krishna consciousness. They simply want to engage you in devotional service. So, this statement that they offer with love, that makes me obliged, this is all nonsense. You know, obliged, obliged to people, obliged to people for being ignorant. As you say, it's the duty of the spiritual master to correct the behavior of the disciple, not to just go along with it. Okay, next question. Arjuna's satisfaction at finally seeing Krishna's two-armed form is a classic example of anthropomorphism, meaning man making God in his own image and projecting his own concepts onto God, who therefore has no such form. Did you get all that? Anthropomorphism, making God, man making God in, in the image of man. We say that the form of God is coming from man. But then, but then they conclude that ultimately God has no form. Impersonalist things. Yes, this is impersonalism. Now, Bible says, Bible and Bhagavad Gita says the opposite. Bible says man is made in the image of God. Yes, and, that's uh, right. From Bhagavad Gita 11th chapter, we understand that uh, the original form of Krishna is the two handed shams in their form. Yes. So, anthropomorphism is one, and uh, the other is zoomorphism, that you know, the, the form of God comes from animals, just like Kurma, Narsimha. Matsya, we've taken from the animal, from the aquatic or from the animal species. And so in the same way, the, this anthropomorphism, that man is made in the image of God. Or God, rather, is made in the image of man. As Maharaji said, it's actually man who's made in the image of God. 
It's not that God is made in the image of man, but this is what they, they claim, that when we give God a human form, they claim, oh, this, we, we, we're, we're saying God has a form like us, you know, they call, they're, they're giving, and then they say, ultimately, actually, God has no form. So, impersonalism. So they were describing Arjuna's satisfaction at seeing Krishna's two-armed form. They did not understand Arjuna's mood of pure devotion. That Arjuna was happy to see Krishna in his original two-armed form because he understood Lord Krishna to be the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he took pleasure in seeing Lord Krishna in his two-armed form. It was very satisfying to him. The universal form is greater than Krishna himself? Wrong. Yeah, we know that's not true. We can see Krishna by severe penances, by giving charity and by worshipping him. No. He himself, he himself recommends all these processes in the Gita itself. So? What does Krishna recommend in the Gita then? Yes. Give me some verses. Resolute determination and devotional service. Just give me the verse. Well, that's Krishna recommending meditation on him. That's Krishna recommending surrender, right? What was that? 11.54 Maharaj. Yes, right. Yeah, we just had the verse, right? Bhakti Mama Bijananti, right? What's the verse? Bhakya ananya sakya aham evam vidvarduna. Okay, like that, yes. Only by devotion Krishna can be understood. That is the point. Krishna says that repeatedly. We heard it in the ninth chapter, we heard it in here in the eleventh chapter, we'll hear it again in the eighteenth chapter. It, it, it is devotion that Krishna wants. It's not that Krishna wants charity. All of these other things, they can be done in relation to Krishna. They should be done in the mood of devotion. There's nothing wrong with these things. You can do them. Yeah, they're there in the Gita. But ultimately, the goal is to develop love for Krishna. If we just simply give charity, charity can be given in the modes. We can give charity in the mode of ignorance. And you can do penances also in the mode of ignorance. Harani Kashipu did great penances. And so we have to be very careful about what we do. But even an even devotional service can be in the mode of ignorance. We have to be very careful. We want pure devotion, not mixed devotion. So Krishna's instruction in uh, the 55th verse, you know, that was very powerful. That was actually the mood of pure devotion. And it was also confirmed there in verse 54. Without material desires, no tinge of desire for fruit of activity or mental speculation, and we should see all living entities equally, see everyone part and parcel of Krishna, like that. Okay, so that's pretty much the uh, 11th chapter covered. We'll just go back and see if we've covered everything. Let's go back. Oh, what happened?
Are you able to see the slides okay? Yes, my dad. Okay, so let's look at the objectives, see if we met all these objectives. Devotees are not concerned with seeing the Vishwarup. Why? What were the reasons? No loving exchange, right? And what else? They can't serve the Vishwarupa. Yeah, there's no there's no reciprocation for the Vishwarupa and we cannot develop the same loving feelings for the universal form. So why did Krishna show the universal form? Why did Arjuna request Krishna to show that universal form? Yes, what was the reason? Two reasons? One was to establish... Establish. Uh, establish that, uh, you know, the God cannot... I mean, even in future someone could uh, philosophically and theoretically establish himself as the God. Okay. So... Yes. Set a criterion. To set a criterion, yes. Right. To set a criterion and to establish the... The divinity. The divini his divinity, right. Okay. And then we spoke about the significance of Arjuna referring to Krishna as Hey Krishna, Hey Yadava, Hey Saketi. When he calls him Krishna, what's wrong? What's wrong with just simply saying Hey Krishna? It's, it's showing that Maharaj that is inferior to him. Why? It, it is not honorific. Uh, right, it was not honorific. He, what he should have said was? Shri Krishna. Shri Krishna, right. And what's the other explanation about his father? Yadava. Yeah, he used, they, he used to call Yadava. No, we're still on the first one. Hey Krishna. Uh, uh, Vasudeva. Vasudeva was his father. He's, he's just, he's a minister, but whereas uh, Pandu Maharaj is a, a warrior, great warrior. Yeah, Pandu was a great, he was a Maharati. The Pandavas were all Maharatis, right? Their father was a Maharati. But Vasudeva was a statesman, politician. Okay. Right. And so, Arjuna was like mocking. And then Yadu, what about Yadava? What's wrong with addressing Krishna as Hey Yadava? Why is he mocking Krishna by calling him Hey Yadava? Who remembers? He belongs to Yadu Dhanesha. Yeah, the Yadus have no kingdom. No kingdom. They had no kingdom. And so it was like a joke, you know, that you're a Yadava, you Yadavas, you have no kingdom, you have no, no land of your own. And hey Saketi, what's wrong there? Condescending. Condescending, right. Uh, you know, I, I, Arjuna was thinking, you're not really worthy, but anyway, I'll, you can be my friend. Right, like that. So condescending. Okay, good. And then, going ahead, example of Krishna displaying Chaturbhuja to Arjuna, establishing Krishna as the original personality of Godhead. Right? So, what happened? How did Krishna show the Chaturbhuja? What did he show before that? Vishwarupa universal form. Universal form. Yeah, Kala Rup. Kala Rup. He, he showed Kala Rup. What, what, what was in Kala Rup? What could you see in the Kala Rup? 
in Kalaru, what did, what, what did Arjuna see? So many faces, eyes. No. In the Kalar group, everyone was uh, in the mouth of the Kalar The soldiers group. of both the parties. Yes, they're all, all, of them. all the entering into the mouths and some have been mouth. crushed in the teeth. Yes, indicating they're all going to die, right? That's the point. The, the, but for the Pandavas, all these soldiers were going to die. So Krishna showed the Kala Rup, and then Arjuna, you know, he didn't. He said, "Can you show me another form? Show me your Chaturbhuj. Show me the forearm form as Narayan." So Krishna showed that one, and then Krishna came back to his original two-arm form. And then finally, points relevant for personal application from the formula of Krishna consciousness given. In the final verse of Bhagavad Gita, of the 11th chapter, personal application, maybe we're not so compassionate on all living entities, or maybe our devotional services mixed with fruit of activity or philosophical speculation. Maybe I'm not working for Krishna. Maybe I'm working for myself. These kind of things. Per personal application. So these are some of the main points. Are there any questions, anyone? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Um, there were times I've heard uh, our devotees uh, saying that they want to disguise the preaching by making it look very charitable because uh, people are used to charity. So they want to uh, get some money from some NGOs like for example, in Malaysia, we have some uh, some certain organizations which will have some funding. So get funding like that. Try to get funding like that. Don't call it ISKCON. Go under some other guys, and then slowly try to bring people in. I'm not in favor of that kind of preaching method, but sometimes uh, some devotees talk like that. They want to do this kind of preaching, indirect style of preaching, and then they are saying, well, eventually they will come in. In the beginning, we'll just offer them charity like that, but, but I'm not in favor, so get a uh, Guru Maharaj view about that. Well, everyone has their own way they want to preach. Let them try and see what result they get. I'm very doubtful that they can get any kind of good result. But, they, uh, you know, they want to do it. Let them do it, you know, but you don't have to get involved in what they're doing. You've got your work to do, your own work, your own preaching, you know. They want to do it like that. Yeah, let them go ahead. You can try, you know. How long will it last? You know, eventually they're going to understand that is is gone. And you are promoting is gone. Why you should hide it? You should be truthful. You don't want to hide the thing. I don't. I. I don't see quite how it's going to help. And so direct preaching can be successful. It's not that you have to hide who you are. You have to be bold. You have to have faith, confidence, enthusiasm. Hmm. Okay, I mean, they want to try something like that. They can try. I don't know how long it will last or how successful it will be. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. I have a question. Can yes, Prabhu. Uh, here in our place, there is a Samiti who is worshipping some Siddha Yogi Purusha. There is a, yeah, according to their, they are very famous in all over the world. But uh, they are actually saying that uh, they can also eat uh, non vegetarian. So if we say the harmfulness of uh, no meat eating, but they are saying that uh, even our uh, in the Sat Charitra, some book they are referring, and they are telling that in that our uh, uh, this person is actually he is a very good soul. He is not seeing whether it is we are offering vegetarian or non vegetarian, it doesn't matter. And they are still uh, in that uh, 
level and they are uh, coding some uh, reference for their uh, activities. So, so how we can uh, deal with such kind of uh, people to come out of that knowledge? Well, we definitely don't support anything which is involved with acts of uh, meat eating, non-vegetarian food stuff, that's against the basic principles of Dharma. Right? The symbol of religion is four legs. Satyam, Sojam, Daya, Tapa. Mm. So Satyam, Sojam, Daya is mercy. And mercy is destroyed by an animal killing. So people who are engaged in taking non-vegetarian food stuff, we see from the Bhagavad Gita also, Lord Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita different foodstuffs, food in the modes, good food in goodness, food in passion, and food in ignorance. So we can establish on the basis of scriptures, and that these kind of principles are there, you know, what kind of religion is it? You're, you're not following the, it's not pure religion, it's, you know, it's, you could say it's religion influenced by the modes of ignorance. Sometimes, as we discuss in our class, sometimes they are telling uh, our, uh, the person who they are worshipping, that's the yogi, he reciprocating with us, so we are always uh, following him, like that they are also too much involved as we discussed like this class, so that's why I ask this question. Yeah, people who want to be cheated, they'll find a cheater, Prabhupada would say. Hmm. What is their philosophy? You know, if you're saying already, they don't take veg, they're, they're not vegetarian. <laughs> That's a big problem. So certainly this is some kind of uh, influence of the mode of ignorance. Tamagun is there. So sense, you know, intelligent people, sensible people will immediately see through it and not be involved. But the people who will be going there, who are drawn to it, they're looking for that kind of thing. They're not willing to make a sacrifice to be vegetarian. They want to satisfy their tongue and eat all that kind of food. They live to eat. <laughs> they don't eat to live. They live to eat. And they want to eat the animal flesh, eat the rotten, dead flesh of the animals. How could there be anything good in the, the food like that, the, the dead bodies of animals? There's nothing good in that. It's terrible. Any intelligent person would immediately want to keep away from it. So these people who are going there, they're still addicted to meat eating. It means that they're attracted to religion in the modes of ignorance. Okay, thank you. Yes, any other questions or comments? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Um, uh, there, the, we had an activity today in which we had to share our experience in which we uh, uh, did something beyond our capacity. Um, so at that time I wanted to say one of my experiences that um, I already shared some time back under the guidance of my Shiksha Guru I did some preaching in my college. So some 50 girls joined and uh, uh, they became serious devotees and uh, after but I knew theoretically that I am not the doer, Guru and Krishna are the doers, but practically I couldn't understand it properly. So uh, afterwards, after leaving the college and after some time when I tried to continue that preaching, 
um, it was not at all working. Even uh, I am not endeavoring as much, and even if I am putting enough endeavor, the result is not coming out as much as those days. So from this, Krishna, Guru, and Krishna made me understand that I was just an instrument during those particular time, those particular circumstances, and during those fortunate times. So I should never think myself as a doer. Okay, yes. Nice realization. <laughs> Krishna, sometimes he gives us great success and other times nothing. That's the way of the world. Sometimes we may be very, very, you know, Krishna can give, or Krishna wants to give, we say God has got ten arms, we only have two. So when he wants to give something, he can give so much. And when he wants to take, he can take also so much. What can we hold on to with our two arms? So you had a good realization, very nice. Of course, we shouldn't be attached to the results. What's important, the success, is in the endeavour. It's not so much the result which is the measure of the success. I mean, you brought 50 ladies into the movement, you say you brought 50 people, they were interested in, like that, in, in the first attempt. So that was very good, but as you say, it was the, by the grace of Krishna. And then again, when you try again later, then you don't get any response. So preaching is like that, you know, sometimes we go for book, we would go for book distribution, we go for our fundraising or making life members, and sometimes, you know, we'd be very good and sometimes we'd, be, we'd struggle, have nothing, no response. So we, we have to be detached. Krishna teaches us detachment and just be attached to the service. Don't be attached to the results so much. Of course, we endeavour for the result. We want to give the result to Krishna, but Krishna wants to see our surrender, how much we've surrendered. That's the real point. point. Okay. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for enlightening me. It means a lot to me. All right. Thank you, Maharaji. Okay, so we will stop here tonight and we'll be back next week and we'll go on to chapter 12. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.